Ray Dalio says it took more than great returns to turn Bridgewater Associates into the world's largest hedge fund. It took principles, prescriptive rules for life and business that Dalio established over four decades. The principles are what make Bridgewater unique and unusual. Now, Dalio has published them in a book along with his life story. I sat down with Ray Dalio at Bridgewater's campus in Westport, Connecticut. Ray, this is your book. I read your book. It's provocative at the very least. It's full of great ideas. It's the one place where I found them in one place. Why'd you write it? Uh, because these principles, everything that I learned, uh, is in the book. Um, I'm at a stage in my life um, in which I'm transitioning <clears throat> from what I'll call the second stage of my life, which is when one tries to be successful and others are dependent on oneself, to the third stage in life in which the greatest joy that I can have is to watch other people be successful. And over these years, I accumulated a bunch of principles that helped me be successful, and I just wanted to pass them along. Um, they were built over many years at Bridgewater because I was making decisions and I was reflecting on them and I wanted to pass them along. It's unusual at the very least for someone in your position, someone managing $160 billion of investments, someone helping to run a company of Bridgewater's size, to write a book like this. How did you find the time? Well, you know, I've been writing these principles down for, I don't know, 20 years because I got in the habit, which is a habit, by the way, I'd recommend to you or anybody else, to whenever I was faced with a decision, to think what are my criteria for making those decisions and then to write them down. Because the same things happen to us over and over again, right? And so particularly if I'm making mistakes and learning, I, it was a good exercise. And then eventually I put some of these things into uh, algorithms to make our investment process. So I found that over the period of time I accumulated that, uh, those principles. And then uh, I didn't feel good about putting the principles out, generally speaking, but um, in 2008 when we caught the financial crisis and uh, we got attention, some people gave us uh, attention and I didn't want the attention, um, but I felt that it wasn't understood, the principles of our company that had made us successful. And so I put them out on a website, and they were downloaded three million times, and I received all sorts of thank you notes because people found them helpful. And then the time came where I thought, I now gather all these together, and in my transition from that second phase to the third phase, I wanted to put it out. So that's how they developed. And so you'd say, what, what was, how long did it take to write the book? I don't know. It took a long time to get the principles you know, it took a lifetime of uh, trial and error. And but there's more than just the principles. There's your own personal story. There is the explanation behind the principles. Um, the th thing about it that I w was reluctant to write that personal part because I don't want people to pay attention to me or somebody's story. This, they make it too, you know, okay, this is Ray Dalio's story. I like people to look be through those pr uh, principles you know, through me to the principles and say that the principles themselves make sense. So if in fact that's what happens, people read your story, find it interesting, but look through it ultimately to your life principles and your work principles, what do you hope to accomplish? Well, I just hope that people will assess those principles and see are they useful. I hope that they will form their own principles. What principles work for them? Is that the most important part? Oh, that's the most important part. In other words, there's a certain power of having principles that, that suit you and that you know and that you can clearly communicate. And I think that that's true today. In other words, what does it mean to be principled? Did you articulate your principles? Um, are you clear? Are you straight? Can you walk the talk? Today in our society, um, I hope that it will encourage people to be more principled. So I'm encouraging other people to put out their principles. I won't give you the names, but I spoke to a number of other people, and I, I want them to put out their principles. Because I think, when I look back, wouldn't I have liked to know what Albert Einstein's principles were or were, uh, 
or Steve Jobs? What were the recipes that led to their successes? What were they going after? And if we had everybody write their principles down and you could look at it, those are sort of recipes. Wouldn't it be nice to have everybody's recipes? Because I could have learned from other people's recipes. You describe systems and processes, even companies and economies for that matter, as machines. Machines is an unusual word. Why machines? Well, I think that to think of it, the human body is a gorgeous machine. It's like our brains as gorgeous machines. It shows that how they have, how they develop, how they have a uh, cause-effect relationships. And I think we're all, the whole ecosystem is a machine. When we start to think about that, we can think about how do we interact with the machine? How do we influence the machine? How do we make the machine work for us? So I'm talking about reality. Okay. There are th three things you need to do in order to be successful, right? I mean, well, most importantly, you have to know what the best decisions are and then you have to have the courage to make them. And so when you look at those uh, choices that you have, you have to be able to deal with reality. And if you f just view it as a machine and not something that's happening to you that you don't own, I think it helps give you a psychology. It helped me. You know, cause-effect relationship. How does this machine work? It's, uh... But anyway, whatever the term is that uh, you're comfortable with, when you realize it is kind of a machine, right? Bridgewater Associates was a consulting firm when Ray Dalio founded it in his two-bedroom New York City apartment. Today, the hedge fund has more than 1,500 employees worldwide and some $160 billion in assets. You've been working at this for since 1975. It's a long time. How close would you say Bridgewater is to being, if you will, the perfect machine? Uh, uh, you know, I don't know. Perfect is, uh, there's so many years, uh, there's so many development. I don't, I don't, it's, you know, it's a tough question to answer. Um, I think, you know, I don't know, halfway there. Or <laughs> I, 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 I don't know how to answer the question. Well, let's, really. let's think about it in a different way. Mm -hmm. What's left to do? What's left to improve? How could it be better? It's like um, DNA. You know, we individually, our responsibilities were vessels for our DNA, but the DNA continues. So when I think of Bridgewater, I think that there, it's as much the next generation and the next generation after that and its cause-effect relationships. And so I think that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a multi, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> but we're just coming, if you will, toward the end of the first generation? Is that where we are in Bridgewater's lifespan? Yeah. We're at the end of the first generation, and that's the beauty of it. That's the transition. You know, uh, what I mean is, for me to have watched the development of the people that I'm working with, uh, Bob Prince, 31 years, Greg Jensen, 21 years, um, hundreds of people. And I feel like a parent of a 40-year-old. And to watch that transition is a beautiful thing. To watch them succeed is a, such a beautiful thing. So it, yes, it's, it's the transition from one generation to the second generation, and to see it as a perpetual motion machine. It's nice to hear someone in your position talk about his company and his employees as if they were part of a family. But people from the outside look at Bridgewater differently. And you've been very sensitive to some of those comments and criticisms and perhaps misperceptions. How would you describe this company? Bridgewater is an idea meritocracy in which the goal is to have meaningful work and meaningful relationships and to do that through radical truthfulness and radical transparency. So, okay, idea meritocracy. The best ideas went out. Um, meaningful work. You're on a mission together. You, um, you have impact. Meaningful relationships. In other words, like an extended family. That, that power of being in it together and realizing that the reward of the relationship is just as great as the reward of the uh, 
success of the business, but to do that by having radical truthfulness. In other words, that you can say what you believe and I can say what we, I believe and that we can have processes in place to have thoughtful disagreement to get past our disagreements. And that radical transparency is the ability for people to see everything so that they don't have uh, second-hand or third-hand stories. I mean, to me, when I look at a company, most companies, uh, it looks disingenuous. And it can, well, all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, um, you know, uh, people don't say what they really think. There's all of the, the office politics. They don't know what the real story is because there's so much spin. Imagine if you can get to see everything. In other words, for most everything, it's taped for everybody to see so they can see things firsthand. To know that people can't talk behind your backs without you hearing it so that it's operated on a firsthand basis. I mean, I think that's what Bridgewater is. It's an idea meritocracy. So in order to have an idea meritocracy, you have to do three things. The first is you have to put your honest thoughts on the table. Most organizations, people are reluctant to be honest. Okay, you have to put your honest thoughts on the table and not be offended if people do. The second is that you have to have thoughtful disagreement. In other words, you respect the fact that somebody has disagreement and that you are curious about that and you have a quality back and forth so that you can ideally come up with a better decision than you would individually because you're open-minded. Not that uh, disagreement is a source of fighting, but so disagreement is a source of coming together. And then the third thing is that you have to be able to get past disagreements in an idea meritocratic way if, you, if they remain, because they're still going to remain. And in order to do that, um, you have to have some kind of process. We have believability-weighted decision-making. There's a lot about Bridgewater you won't find at other hedge funds. Ray Dalio designed it to be an idea meritocracy and says the key is a process he calls believability-weighted decision-making. I should explain believability-weighted decision-making to you if, you, sure. if you're interested. Uh, I think I have an idea about what it means, but go ahead. Um, okay, so ordinarily, you know, there are two ways of making decisions, pretty much. Uh, there's the boss has control. And so autocratic. Autocratic. Right. I'll call that autocratic. Takes in everything and then he makes a decision. Or there's democratic, pretty much. One man, one vote. Um, but really, the best decision making is believability weighted decision making. And if you think about it first conceptually, you would say, um, if you're going to make a decision of what you, you have a medical condition. And you're going, to, how are you going to get that? You're going to think, who are the best doctors? Consult the experts, right? Consult the experts. But this one knows more and that one knows more, less. And how do you do it? And then you have this triangulation. And then you make that. That's kind of the idea of believability decision making. We have ways of assigning uh, believability that we all agree are fair, that we each assess each other, and we get certain amount of believability points. So now imagine that you had believability, your believability on a subject matter. Maybe it's investing, maybe it's accounting, whatever the subject is, that you have a certain amount of believability weighted points and you're together. Well, those believability weighted points, uh, when you say, okay, what should I make as a decision? Now I'm responsible for something, but I ask everybody else, I, and I take a believability weighted vote. I can have a believability weighted vote. When I have that believability way to vote, I really do believe that it's going to be a better decision than I would individually make. That's believability way to decision making. And it's fantastic um, be, when you have independent thinkers. In, in order to be successful in the markets or as an entrepreneur, one has to be um, an independent thinker that makes decisions better than the consensus decisions. It's fair. In the markets, the consensus is built into the price. It's beta. Yeah. So now um, you have to bet against the consensus to make money. Therefore, you have to be an independent thinker. 
the best dynamic is to have a bunch of independent thinkers. Now you've got a bunch of independent thinkers. How are they going to have thoughtful <laughs> disagreement and get past those disagreements? How we have done that is the key to our success, and it's outlined in the book. Even management gurus who would applaud many of the principles and many of the practices that you advocate and that you explain articulately would also say that the whole construct is kind of utopian, if you will. Has it felt to you in the process of building Bridgewater and all of these things that make it what it is, has it felt anything like a social experiment or is it have, has it felt different? It's, it's, it's eminently practical, right? If it's otherwise, the, the, the results show it, right? It's the reason for, this, for the success that I've had or the Bridgewater's had, right? I mean, the, we got 40 years of looking at this thing. So this is not utopian, this is realistic, Real. right? But I would like, that's why I wrote the book. People can read the bits and pieces. You, could, you read them one by one and you could say, does that piece make sense? Isn't it sensible to have an idea merit meritocracy where the best ideas win out? Okay, now, what are the rules of the game to achieve that? That's what it's Isn't that about. better? Well, if you want to get to the idea of meritocracy, you've got to have a way of getting there. Right. If you want to get to the best answer, it's not going to be in your head. I think one of the greatest tragedies of mankind is that people stubbornly have wrong opinions in their head that they could easily stress test and get to better opinions collectively if they could be forthright with each other and go through the processes I outline in the book. And the reason, and they, they have to have humility. I learned the fear of being wrong. I'm fearful of being wrong. And it's because of that that I need that, those independent decision makers. So I think it's a very practical, it's not utopian, it's practical. Much of the book and much of what you describe now is an implicit and occasionally explicit critique of traditional management and traditional leadership. Tell me what's wrong with the way most companies are run. It's dishonest. Um, it's dysfunctional. I mean, dishonest meaning you don't know what that guy's really thinking. It all goes on behind the doors. And everybody's doing their politics. Okay. So that's, that's not an environment that include, uh, encourages the ownership, the straightforwardness. Dysfunctional, when people don't know what other people are really thinking. What it, uh, what's, it seems to me like what is crazy and what's normal, right? Is it crazy to be radically truthful and radically transparent with each other? To say what you mean, to work it through, and to know that there's no, none of that game's playing? Isn't it more efficient? And isn't it more straightforward? Why? It's a psychological barrier. Most people have a psychological barrier. Psychologists and um, neuroscientists tell me that it's because of how the brain is wired. That there's a part of our brain called the amygdala. Mm -hmm. And when we have a disagreement, there's an inclination to think that that's a fight rather than a curiosity, okay? And so that tends to cause it. And it's also how we're raised. You know, from a very early age, the whole idea of being right is so rewarded, whereas learning from mistakes doesn't have its place, right? You, so a kid studies, oh, you're smart, 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 you take the examination, and okay, you do badly, and, but life's not like that. Life is mostly a matter of making your mistakes and knowing how to evolve past those mistakes and learn. So when I look at a traditional company, it doesn't value the, that learning process, that mistake base. Talking about what people are really like. Nobody talks about what people are really like. Why not? Good question. Why not? Don't is it because human nature explains the why not, this, the amygdala? I think it's a combination of, uh, psychologists tell me, um, that it's a combination of some amount of programming, the amygdala, and some amount of um, 
the environmental, the, the education system, how we're growing the up. The society we live in. Right. We know subliminally um, that the greatest people are the people who make mistakes, learn from them, and grow and evolve, right? And I've had the opportunity to get to know the most remarkable, successful people in the world. And they have all gone through uh, the mistake making and the learning from that. It's the learning that comes from mistakes that makes people more successful than knowing the right answers. And yet we have those kinds of barriers. So the key to our success has been, I don't mean to lecture, but I do mean to pass along what has been the keys of our success. Ray Dalio says all great leaders make mistakes. What sets them apart is how they learn from those mistakes. Dalio wishes they'd all write those lessons down. Principles is his way of sharing the ones he learned while building Bridgewater. So who's on your list of good leaders then? Bill Gates is a great, Elon Musk, um, uh, you know, the, the, there, are sh there are shapers, Jack Dorsey, uh, Reed Hastings, in, those, uh, in some of the business community, mm -hmm. in the philanthropic. Uh, somebody uh, I admire enormous is Mohammed Yunus, um, fine microfinance and has found uh, really the inventor of social enterprise and he knows how to make essentially uh, businesses um, out of philanthropy, in other words to make them self-sustaining. Fantastic. Jeffrey Canada, um, Harlem Children's Zone, mm -hmm. um, in other words a vision. Uh, these are visionaries who are shapers. Um, you know, they're just, and anyone, those are contemporary, those are, th th those are, uh, it's very difficult in government. Well, you spent a lot of time with Mario Draghi. Would you put him on that list? Oh, I'd put Mario Draghi on that list. I would say Ber Ben Bernanke is a hero, okay? In other words, the person who stood up and at a very difficult time uh, with a sacrifice, personal sacrifice, to do the right things. The political system has its, uh, its, its, its challenges. It sounds to me like the unifying threads among all of these people whom you do admire are, on the one hand, independence, independent thinking and creativity, and on the other hand, the courage to pursue either one or both of those things. I mean, everybody has their role. That's the thing I've also learned, that the, everybody has their own nature and the role, and it takes a team. And so, I, I, yes, I like the fact that those people, for the good of whatever, can go from visualizing something, visualization to actualization, to build it out. However, I can tell you that all of those people at all need people who have different natures and different abilities. The big conceptual, big picture thinker needs a person who's paying attention to all the detail you know, the, the creative person who's not reliable needs the reliable person who's not creative. Have any companies earned your admiration? Other psychologists who've come in and examined it, uh, our company say that there are comparisons. Um, I would say that um, Netflix with Reed Hastings uh, has earned my admiration. Um, I, um, Jack Dorsey and uh, Twitter in terms of that radical transparency and want the idea of meritocracy has earned my admiration. Um, some, so there are some, but I'm not an expert on it. You were, Ray, among the first people to computerize, if you will, systematize, computerize the investment process, right? To turn your ideas, your principles into algorithms and put them to work in financial markets. I don't know of anybody who has tried to computerize the management process the way that you have. Why do you think it is that Ray Dalio, in that respect, is out there on his own? Um, I think it's going, uh, going to happen. Um, I think I learned at a very, you know, many years ago that almost anything that I think I can computerize the criteria for making decisions. By the way, that would be one of the greatest gifts I can give people is the understanding of um, when you're thinking what cri I'm, I'm making a decision. Now slow up and think 
What are the criteria? Write those criteria down. You can put those criteria into equations because the brain is 89 billion neurons, which are little computers, and then it gets input from the outside. Well, th that, what your brain is doing, can in many ways be done better by the computer if you go through that exercise. So I learned that almost any decision making could be computerized. So now, whenever I'm dealing with people, I realized that that could be put into algorithms. Okay, now imagine the power of that. Just like the, in the investment. Because all it knows all of that information. It knows what all those people are like. It knows what's happening. And when it has all that power of all of that information, and it has those types of criteria, it can bring to you all of that. And it makes the, that decision in the same way our investment can be making decisions. So right now, it's working like a GPS works in parallel. And I think that's, by the way, the best. When you have an, um, the computer making the decision like a GPS makes a decision and you're making a decision in parallel, those two things line up and you make better decisions. And all, all companies eventually will, will, will do this kind of thing. Yeah. And people too? Yeah. I think that you're going to, you're, you're not far f from being able to go to your smartphone and just like you call in Google and you say, what am I, um, you know, what's the facts? And you get your facts like this, that you'll be able to call in and get your advice. Um, idea meritocratic decision making by experts. You see, two things are coming together at the same time. And that is radical transparency and algorithmic decision making. Okay, radical transparency means that almost anybody can know almost everything about you maybe more than your wife knows about you, because you're leaving these, this data, these fingerprints, all over the place. So the data on you gives you a profile so that the computer knows you, okay? You take that data and you put it together with algorithms, and those algorithms are going to say, how do I deal with him in a way that's better, more tailored to you than the human could? That's where we are, right? Is the outcome inevitably good? Because if you think about it, the outcome of a system like that, particularly put to bad use, could be frightening. Well, it's like most things. It has good and, some good and bad sides to it. But I think that, um, like we found it m miraculous because uh, you certainly can make better decisions. You can make those decisions idea meritocratically if everybody's involved in making those algorithms. In other words, like I wrote the principles in the book, mm -hmm. you could write an algorithm. And since everybody agrees on the algorithm, they agree on the decision-making criteria. So you think it has applicability. Right now, the machine you've built works for a 1,500-person, privately-owned company. How applicable is it to other organizations? Is it applicable to other companies? Maybe not in, in its exact form, but something similar to it? Larger companies? Is it applicable to governments? Let's first make clear what the it is. I think it's the broad category of do you have an idea of meritocracy? Uh, if that's the it that you're talking about. Well, the, the there's two, all, there are two it's. Okay. Idea meritocracy on the one hand and a systematic way of supporting it on the other. Yeah. First of all, you have to want the first. I mean, as an ideal, everyone can, should be able to embrace Right? An idea yeah. meritocracy. But in order to So it's the second part really that's the bigger question. It's the first part that's the bigger question. <laughs> and the reason it's the first part Well that's the more existential question. Yeah, can you be honest with each other? Can you accept reality? And and can you find it? Well let's, because let's make if, the assumption that you can. Okay. So but I did first want the idea of meritocracy because we're gonna have partnerships and how am I gonna behave with each other and all that. And it was the need for that that led to the development of tools and this other stuff. So I think that you first have to have the need for the idea of merit meritocracy. And if you have that need, then you will find your way. I get it. For every, it, it has to be an evolutionary organic process. You can't drop it in. It's not a piece of software you can download. Well, you can do this at quicker, quick. we can drop in. We're about to take algorithms that we have and, and tools and we're going to give them to others. 
We want to. We want. We to would like. Uh, well, we're figuring. We're figuring out how to make that fit in a number of other companies to just pass it along. I want to. I'd love these tools to be able to be used by anybody who cares to use the tools. You've intrigued me. Are we talking about big companies? Are we talking about... Big companies. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who, who are eager to use it. I don't want to mention their names, but big companies that are eager to use those tools. Eager to use those tools and eager to have an idea of meritocracy. Give us a sense. It's, it's a little difficult to talk about it in abstract terms. Are we talking about a GE kind of a company? Uh, we're talking about uh, Silicon Valley type companies. Really? Yeah. Big Silicon, Silicon Valley. Big, big Silicon Valley companies. And, but I bet beyond Sil Silicon Valley. But, uh, there is a, there, particularly, though, uh, in Silicon Valley, there is more of that um, notion that there's a power in crowdsourcing, decision making, and that it is idea meritocratic. So there is a desire, really, to have those things. And then to use tools, because we've developed so many, to pass them along, there's a lot of that kind of desire. Traditional organizations are having, are more challenged by that. But you, I'm still seeing it in other traditional organizations. I won't drop specific companies because it wouldn't be fair to them. Uh, but uh, in many traditional organizations, you're seeing them become less traditional. And you certainly are seeing them use um, tools and data to understand their people and to help those people uh, work together. Now the question is, do they do that radically transparently and radically honestly? Now is this going to be a business for Bridgewater or is this something that you're doing um, altruistically? It won't, be a, it won't be a business for Bridgewater. It, I, I don't know what we're going to do. We haven't figured out exactly how we're going to do it. but. Um, We'll get those things out there somehow. That's where it is, really. And how far away are we from seeing the first evidence of that effort? You know, probably 18 months, two years, it's something pretty, like that. Pretty close. Many successful companies find it hard to thrive once their founders move on. The next generation doesn't share the same values, or the culture gets watered down. Ray Dalio wants to make sure that doesn't happen at Bridgewater. Ray, you're clearly very concerned with succession and with Bridgewater's future, unsurprisingly, but you're very concerned. Why is it so important? Well, I don't, you know, I was saying if. If, if you're not worried, you need to worry. And if you're worried, you don't need to worry. <laughs> because if you worry about things, then you take care of those things. So when I say concerned, mm. um, uh, we've been going through what we said was a, an up to 10 year transition process. Turned out it's taken about seven years. And concerned would be the wrong way, uh, wrong word. Um, Uh, what I am is um, like, as I say, going from one generation to another. So if you have a 40-year-old who I've worked with, all these people for so many years, and that, you know, that's, that's it. It's now theirs. It's been a trial and error process. Like most learning. Why has it been difficult? You knew it would take time. You figured it oh. would take as long as 10 years, but it's been challenging. Well, because uh, it, we, we knew that that was going to be challenging. And, I mean, it would be so naive not to think it would be challenging. When any uh, founder or, you know, f uh, owner, founder owner, makes a transition to the next generation, um, it's like almost doing anything that is you never done before. And you think about so many organizations, anybody would tell you organizationally, when you're making that kind of a transition, of course it's going to be a new experience. I mean... That's, I, it's a side, it's of everything I do. Everything I do, which is a new experience, is going to be challenging, it's going to have problems, it's going to have mistakes. It's this five-step process that I sort of described in the book. Are you there yet? Or are you at the oh, point where Bridgewater can function without Ray Dalio? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is, and, and we know we're there now, 
uh, because of what we've gone through. I mean, we're, and I say no, nobody's 100% sure of anything. Right. You know, I, I couldn't tell you whether we would function with Ray Daly, <laughs> you know, but, um, but we're at a stage where uh, I, I've never been more confident that we're in, in great shape. And let me be clear, I'm not leaving the investment part of the thing. Uh, You'll remain a co-CIO. I'm going to remain a co- I love investments. I love economics. That's my game. My objective is uh, to not ever be needed, to be to watch others be successful without me. And uh, we are there. I get to play my game, but I don't want to be needed and I'm not needed. You thought you were there before, though. How do you know that you have the right leadership in place? You've got two co-CEOs in Eileen Murray and David McCormick. You've got two fellow co-CIOs with Greg Jensen and Bob Prince. How will you know that, they're, that that's the right mixture? And uh, what if one of those well, people, we, what, what happens if one of those people leaves? Well, that's the beauty of it. I mean, you just rattled off the co's. Okay, so there's a co-CEOs, there are co-CIOs. Uh, there's always backup and there's that kind of duplication. There's a board that's overlooking at it. Uh, things that many of the things that weren't in place when you know we started this journey. So um, you, you know, like uh, I would say, if if you compare us with almost any company, and you say, do you have co CEOs? Do you have co CIOs? How do you have a team, a large team, um, who's worked together for a long time? It's probabilities. So we've we've evolved. Um, I think the uh, all, all organizations go through this, particularly when you have a founder or own company, and uh, you know it's uh, important to work out that way. The founder's still going to be around. He's still going to be founders managing the portfolios. Be, that's right. But it's like a it's like a father with I don't know. Maybe that's a bad analogy, but it, it's like a father with um, the kids and the next generation. Except the kids are forty years old. So I'm, I'm happy to be a mentor, but my greatest success is when others don't need me. That's the idea of the book. Everything that I know about life and work is in that book. And everything I know about economics and investments will be in the next book. And really, I do believe that there's nothing that I know that's of value that isn't in those two books. And, and I'm also watching them independently beyond those principles do great so uh, I feel good about this transition I don't think anybody has paid more attention to transition and has been more transparent about that transition than we have and when you think how many organizations have over 60 year leaders who are not talking about transition who are not so transparent who don't write the rules who haven't begun a seven-year process I mean, I would worry about them, not about <laughs> us, right? Um, this next book that will contain Bridgewater's economic and investment principles, to me, it sounds like you're going to give away the Colonel's secret recipe of 11 herbs and spices to Kentucky Fried Chicken. Why do it? Um, no. So, um, again, it's, it's my economic principles and, and that, which, of course, are complementary. But it's like the... Uh, the 30-minute video that I gave, uh, how the economic machine works. I mean, basically, half of what I think, most all important things that I think are contained in that 30-minute video. This will be similar. This will just be an ex uh, a more complete version of that. So it's the sort of things that don't have the precision of the calculations or anything like that. They're just the concepts. You're not giving away the algorithms. Right. Oh, no, I'm not giving away the algorithms. <laughs> No, but, but I am giving away the concepts. Bridgewater was one of the few hedge funds that made money during the financial crisis. That turned founder Ray Dalio into something of a guru. Policymakers around the world came knocking, seeking his advice. You talk in the book about your dialogue with Mario Draghi, and you talk about the pleasure you took advising other public officials. Is that something you want to do more of? Yeah, I, as long as they find it helpful, I, I find it helpful. I, I, I want, yeah. 
How good or bad a job are those public officials collectively doing right now managing the world economy? Well, uh, by and large, at the there's fiscal policy, there's monetary policy, and that's what they're doing. If I take monetary policy, I think that they have done a remarkable job, that we have had what I call um, a significant, beautiful deleveraging. And what I mean is that our debt burdens and our debt service burdens have gone down while the economy has grown and we haven't had an inflation problem. And, that, and they did that um, by understanding the mechanics and the engineering. And I really do think, to some extent, I was, was able to be of some help in, in terms of that exercise. But I think they've done a beautiful job. And so if you look at the economy right now, for the shorter term where we are, we have a situation where we don't have too much inflation and too little inflation. And we don't have too much growth and too little growth. And we don't have a debt bubble and so on. We have something that is reasonable in terms of those types of conditions. This is very different than 2008. Um, we have a political situation, which is um, difficult. We have a wealth gap and an opportunity gap, which is a difficult situation. And we have very big obligations coming forward, pension obligations, health care obligations that are going to be a burden. That's going to be a gradual uh, problem. But the way that those f monetary, um, those who are running monetary policies have done, have handled that well. By and large, fiscal, p uh, fiscal policy, reasonably, I think, reasonably well. It's a very much more politicized uh, area. So That's a much more favorable characterization than a lot of people would give fiscal policy. Most people would give fiscal policy two thumbs down. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, you hear a hesitancy in terms of my giving it compliments okay. relative to the other, but I think that the political environment itself is such a difficult environment, and, and so politics itself is dysfunctional. And uh, I mean, we have to talk about how to deal with idea of meritocratic, thoughtful decision making. That's a different question. But nonetheless, if you take the individuals and you put them in their jobs, and you're asking how do they do in those jobs, all things mm -hmm. considered, and all that's the problem. Those are things that we have to consider. That they, um, you know, have have done um, in fiscal policy. Yeah, you know, um, I think we have. I think it's a, the political system is a is a very challenging situation. If you were advising the president, what would you tell him to do, or what would you suggest that he do? Um, the, fo the most important thing is to uh, make sure that we understand what the country's principles are that bind us together rather than those that divide us. To have idea meritocratic decision making, to try to come up with the best collective decisions, to, to, to bring the country together in an idea meritocratic way. Um, I. I think the period that we're in reminds me very much of 1937, if I was to pick the, a, an analogous period of time. Because at that time, it was after the financial crisis. We had 29 to 32, which is the equivalent of our 2008 to 2009. They printed a lot of money. Asset prices went up. Interest rates went to zero. And we had a large wealth gap, which created populism, analogous. The central bank begins to tighten monetary policy. And then we had a populism, and we had a fall in the stock market, and we had confidence. So we are once again at that precipice? Well, we, yes, we, have a, 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 we cannot have a tightening of monetary policy that's material. We have a very large wealth gap, a very large gap that um, the top two-tenths of one percent of the population's wealth equals the bottom 90 percent of the population's wealth. And it's not just wealth. There is a polarity. And this is a time where we have both of those things. If you have, you can't have an economic downturn because socially and politically we could not stand an economic downturn, right? We will be at each other's throats. It's a threat to our system, right? So it's in many ways analogous. That, those tensions, that conflict, I think it's in many ways analogous. So 
That's fearful to me. So when you ask what I would recommend the President of the United States to do, is to try to deal with conflict well, to bring people together, to not make one side in a battle with the other side, and to try to have idea meritocratic ways to get at the best decisions. That's what I would recommend the President do. You write in your book, only people can discover things and then program computers to do them. Today, when people think about inequality, they worry about the risk that they'll be replaced by machines. Will your statement always be true? Will humans always have an edge over computers? Um, or will the notion computers of, replace us? The notion, the, the notion of intuitions, imagination, the same type of creativity uh, comes from millions of years of programming that is in the brain. Uh, if you have... Uh, if, if genetic programming. Genetic programming, okay? Those, we have a lot of genetic programming that are those intuitions. I think that um, for the foreseeable future, for a very, very long time, those elements will not be able to be achieved in the same way as the computer is. And so the best thing is when the computer and, and man, imaginative people, are working together. But we're coming into an era in which basically you can either code, in other words, take your imaginations and encode them, which is the new language. Have your kids learn coding, because if not, they will not know, it's equivalent to not knowing how to read and write. They will need to express themselves that way. And when you have that and working with the computer, that's the ultimate power, and I think that that's where uh, I think that that's where we're heading. And if you don't have it, you get replaced by a computer. It's it's either you're doing the programming or you're getting replaced by a computer, for the most part, for a lot. People worry about that. Do you worry about it? I do worry about it, but I I, I worry. Uh, I, there's an economic component. I, this split is a big thing. I just did a study for uh, examining the bottom 60% of the economy. So this is the majority of Americans. And if you look at the conditions of the majority of Americans, the bottom 60%, it is a very bleak picture. Averages don't convey it. And unless you're in the middle of it, you don't see it. And that, um, that is intolerable. That's, that's going to be a problem. Now, how you deal with it is a, that's a complicated question because in many cases, evolution and productivity is connected to this wealth disparity. It's producing the wealth disparity, and it's producing those things. So it's going to become increasingly challenging to figure out um, what do you do about it. That's a whole big topic.